And welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce all of you today, uh, Professor Rehan Kaparia, um, who is a professor in the Electrical Engineering Department at the University of Southern California. He has a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley from 2013. And his interests lie at the intersection of material science and electrical engineering, the focus on developing next generation electronic devices for computing applications beyond CMOS. So today he will tell us about going beyond CMOS, materials approaches for functional diversification of CMOS platforms, non von Neumann computing, and electronic biological. Welcome again. All righty, thank you. So, um, uh, so I know that this is the AI seminar, and if it's okay, I'll, is it all right if I walk around or should, sure, I, should I just stand in one, uh, one location? So I know that this is the AI seminar, um, and I know that my work is very much on kind of the bottom end of the materials project spectrum of things. So um, there's going to be this mismatch, and what I'm going to try to do here is deliver some value to you guys by bridging this mismatch and showing what are some of the fundamental materials and device type advances we're trying to make and we're trying to use to actually push forward towards computing systems that are not necessarily going to be used in the next five years, but maybe in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years, right? So how do we enable that next generation of scaling? Um, so I had this long title going, you know, I copied and pasted the title from my abstract onto my slides and I was like, this is ridiculously long. What a mistake. So I just deleted everything except for going beyond the sequence. Because that kind of fundamentally captures uh, a lot of the thrust that we're working on. And uh, um, essentially, there's, 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 three, there's three topics which we have in different levels of maturity in our program, in my program. So one of them is new materials growth techniques for CMOS plus three fives. I'll explain what that means. This is, this is kind of my most mature technology it's, it's stuff that uh we have you know multiple growth labs for and we have a reasonable amount of funding from both ac uh, industry and academia uh next uh next uh, um next topic is really on this idea of can we use processes fundamental physical processes which we don't like in normal digital logic can we take those fundamental physical processes and actually potentially start to implement uh, new types of functionality into device. Okay, that's the second thing. And then the last thing is, uh, it's gonna be preliminary results, but I think it's really cool that if you have biological cells, their, their dimensions are on the order of hundreds of microns. Uh, transistors are on the order of hundreds of nanometers. So with a colleague of mine from the BME department and with a, another colleague from the Keck School of Medicine, we're starting to ask ourselves, how can we actually integrate it such that we have you know, functional units that can communicate with cells and go back and forth? That's super preliminary because the first question that we're still trying to uh, answer, and we've kind of gotten there, is can we keep both of them alive? Can you keep cells alive with electronics and can you, can you keep electronics alive with cells? Um, but uh, the, the, the primary, the primary, or the, the major focus of my work is going to be uh, talking about this and then this stuff. So, you know, let me, let me, uh, uh, let me say this. Right now, uh, from my perspective, my perspective as a device person, we're living through two paradigm shifts which are extremely dramatic. And, and I mean they're dramatic because they're really, uh, they're almost, earth-shattering for us because the first thing is that digital scaling for digital logic is over right it's over from my perspective no one's going to be giving me money to basically make a three nanometer transistor or one nanometer transistor. it's not going to happen right? digital scaling is over so now on one hand that's a bad thing because uh, yes. why are they not oh because basically what it comes down to is now Industry already has seven nanometers in production. Five nanometers is pretty clear. Three nanometers may come in, may not come in, depending on uh, uh, depending on uh, you know whether the cost, manufacturing cost versus performance works out. But essentially, they have visibility all the way to the end. We don't need to see. But we don't need academia to do any more research to see what's going to happen. So they won't give you money because other because people are doing it. In it's already being done in in industry and it's already it's already 
there's there's a lot of visibility that's already out there. Um, so that's that, and so so you know, the past you know 15, 20, 30 years as a device designer, which is how I started my life. There you know, I, there was no point in doing anything other than making smaller transistors. There just wasn't because if you tried to work on something else, five years later, silicon and steamroll you. Right, so it always made sense to, as a device designer, work on making transistors. Now it turns out there's another paradigm shift that's happened over the past, you know, whatever, X number of years, which is, you know, where all of you come in. Um, and it's the fact that it turns out that these machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms are, turns out that they're really valuable, right? Um, so there's a lot of people making a lot of money on these things. And so, um, What's interesting about this is that I, it, it really starts to raise the question, what type of things can we do on this bottom end, right? What kind of things can we do on this bottom end, given the fact that this is over, right? What can we do on this bottom end to support this? And so that's, that's what we think about a lot. And so there are, um, uh, so, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a statement here that is unsubstantiated, and we can revisit it in 15, 20, or 30 years to see if it was right or not. But the first 50 years of systems were driven by making these lateral transistors smaller. I really think that the next 50 years is going to be driven by heterogeneous integration, and specifically, the ability to scale the bandwidth of connection between different functional units. I really think that that's what it's going to be. I don't know if it's true or not. We'll find out, right? Um, this is a nice thing about making projections that far into the future. You know, I can, <laughs> I don't have to worry about it for a little while. <coughs> so my, in this first thrust, my, my question is really, you know, what do we want? How can we do this type of heterogeneous? How can we create manufacturable technologies that enable this type of heterogeneous? That's really what I'm looking at. And um, so I have two images here. This is, uh, it's called present. It's not really present. This is from I think, 2004. But this is a scanning electron micro, uh, micro, microscopy image of a cross section of an old AMD processor. Okay. And what is happening here is that we have one layer of devices. Okay. So this is the silicon. And all of these are metal layers of interconnects. So active devices and interconnects. Active devices, interconnects. Now, potentially when we talk about heterogeneous integration, the question is, can we you know, move to this kind of future where we have uh, you know, a whole set of devices with you know, micron scale integration, micron scale interconnects. And, and you know, the reason I say micron scale, the reason that's important is because the closer you move two things together, Basically, the, the higher the bandwidth connection between those two blocks. Right? So I think that's, that's, that's fundamentally what it comes down to. And you know, this is already the direction that people are going when it comes to chip stacking and things like that. But effectively, what you're doing is you're taking a bunch of these and you're stacking them on top of each other. So when you're mechanically stacking things, it requires large wafers. It requires thick, um, uh, uh, long length scales. So that means, what's, what does that do to your bandwidth? It reduces your overall bandwidth. Connection. So our, our so then you know we can so now this is where we're really going to get into the weeds and I'm going to try to take you along this materials journey with me. Um, but if at any point there's something that's unclear, just you know this is an intimate enough room. Just yell out. Just ask me any questions. Um, so the first question is why can't we why can't we have what we want when we want it, right? Uh, and fundamentally. It actually comes down to the atomic structure of these materials. Really, that really is what prevents us from having what we want when we want. Now, we have the silicon, which are these you know beautiful long long range crystals, right? Where electrons can zip around and allow us to have you know high performance, high speed devices, low power, high speed, whatever you want, right? And then we have all of this other stuff on top, which is quote unquote amorphous, meaning the atoms are not arranged in any order. So because they're not arranged in any order, if you make semiconductors out of them, it's just not great. Okay, it's not great. You can do certain things, but it's not going to be great for high performance devices. Period. Okay, and so 
Um, effectively, what happens is that oh, I was going to use the I was going to use the I'm going to try this. See how this. No, that's actually not so bad. So um, so for example, if I if I have this crystalline material on the bottom, I can grow various types of layers on top of it with you know with the various material growth techniques, and they will be great. They'll be high performance. But how many layers will I have? I have one layer of devices, right? So maybe I can make devices that are a little bit faster than silicon, but as I mentioned before, we're at this point where we're scaled down. Silicon is scaled down so far that it's not really that important to do that anymore. On the other hand, if I try to take these the same same no, this is this is too far beyond my physical capability. If we take these same materials approaches that make these really nice layers of high quality semiconductors, and we put it, try to do it on top of this, this is what we get. Now, this looks worse than this, and it is. That's fundamentally what it comes down to. You can't use the standard state-of-the-art growth processes to be able to make these multiple layers. So that's why people resort to things like chip stacking or other processes like epitaxy. Basically, physical transfer processes where you grow your materials on something in life, and then you transfer it. Or you just make multiple things and you transfer it together. The problem is that manu from a manufacturing perspective, it's hard. Um, and especially if you start thinking about going to really highly scaled manufacturing. So, so then our question is, you know, are there, are there fundamental ways in, uh, from a materials perspective that we can attack this problem, right? And so um, to, kind of, to kind of hammer home this point, uh, you know, when we have this silicon substrate down here, we have this really great, you know, crystalline lattice where all the atoms are arranged perfectly. So when I use my standard growth techniques, I send in all these other atoms, and they arrange really nicely on top of that. Easy. But if I try to do the same thing up here, if I try to do the same thing up here, these, the, all of these things, they look, the atoms look like this. There's no order. There's no order there. So the, when I send all these other atoms in to make this next layer of materials, it, 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 it just doesn't form into this nice long-range crystals. So um, what we really want is to be able to go from current state of the art, which is this, to this thing. Because if we can, if we can enable this, then we can start thinking about, well, all right, I take my silicon wafer, build my first layer of devices, you know, put my first layer of interconnects and put a dielectric on top, make another layer of devices. Not necessarily high performance devices. Maybe I wanted to do local memory. Maybe I wanted to do some kind of sensors, you know, whatever. And then put it up, potentially put another layer on top and another layer on top, right? That's, that's what could be enabled. But, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but, uh, you know, fundamentally, what ends up happening is that uh, if I take this to any foundry in the world, you know, whether it's uh, making, you know, whatever it makes, they can deliver things that look like this on top of crystalline substrates. And they can also deliver things like this on top of non-crystalline substrates. So what we have done here I'm really hammering home the point. I think I think you guys uh, you guys got it. Um, what we have done here is basically we've said, all right, well, we actually have a new way of growing these materials. Instead of just taking, so say I want to grow a three five. It turns out three fives are really great materials. They're high performance. They have uh, you know great optoelectronic properties. Um, you know we can make lasers and LEDs from them. We can make high speed transistors. Oh, thank you. We can make, wow, this silhouetting is, uh, <laughs> oh, we can make high-speed transistors from them. Um, they're great. In fact, they're also great for solar cells, which is actually originally where I started doing this work. But um, solar cells are another area where silicon really dominates also. Um, but basically, what we've been able to show is using this technique of ours, right, we can actually grow things that look like this on top of non epitaxial substrates. So now, just from just from a visual perspective, it looks better. Um, and it is better. And I'll, I'll talk about it in more detail later. Uh, but essentially, what happens in a normal state-of-the-art growth technique is that, say I want to grow Indian phosphide, what do I need? I need indium. I need phosphorus. And the way it works is I, sh I send in a precursor of indium, send in a precursor of phosphorus. They react on the surface, and then they grow. So we said, well, you know, 
If I take a glass of water and I throw in sugar into that water, eventually I'll supersaturate that and I'll precipitate out crystals of sugar, right? And we all know this. Um, who doesn't like putting sugar in their iced tea, right? I know I do, and iced tea just doesn't hold enough sugar for me. But what we can do is we can do the same process, but instead of, uh, instead of just sweetening our tea, we can actually make semiconductors that way. So what we do is we actually put down these metals. So for example, I'll put down a layer of indium metal, and I'll use certain processes uh, to be able to control it such that when I heat it up, it'll turn into a liquid, you know, just like the water. But I will control the geometry of that liquid. And by controlling the geometry of that liquid, I can then start to throw in phosphorus. Just throw in phosphorus. And then what will happen is that the only thing that can come out of that liquid indium plus phosphorus mixture, when I put too much phosphorus in, is this crystal of indium phosphide. And that crystal of indium phosphide will just consume this entire liquid template. That's obviously it's a little bit different than the sugar and water example, but I don't. There's no other example I have which is good enough to describe this. And so by doing that, what it actually allows us to do is. So this is this is a SEM optical this SEM image of uh, scanning electron microscope image of. Uh, indium phosphide grown on a thin layer of molybdenum metal, okay, which is a non, basically it's, think of it as being, not having any crystalline relationship with it. And you can see that this doesn't look that great. Um, and in fact, those, the grains are very small, meaning the crystals don't orient nicely with each other. On the other hand, if we do the same process, or if we do the same thing on molybdenum, using this, this, this process, this liquid phase process that we have, we actually can get these really nice large scale crystals that are of relevant size for devices. Okay. So there's a lot of details in the material science behind how that works, but you know, fundamentally, fundamentally the reason that it works is when you use a vapor phase process, we get a whole bunch of these little nuclei of our crystals and those nuclei will grow out and touch each other, and there's no relationship between them. So as soon as they touch, that's a, that's a boundary, a defect boundary. On our side, what we do is we actually control it, so I only create one nuclei, and then I just grow that nuclei out. Right. So that's that's the fundamental that's the fundamental process there. And there's a lot of uh, um, <coughs> details here, but what this is actually what you're actually seeing here. This is a large scale image of how we. Uh, uh, we take it and we actually grow these indium phosphide nuclei. They grow out and then eventually it completes into a film. This was for solar cells. So it's polycrystalline, but this you can see that the scale bar between these nuclei, you know, we're talking about millimeter scale. So in terms of electronic devices, you know, a single crystal of a millimeter, that's like, you know, that's 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 a lot of devices. Um, and then you know the reason why it happens, uh, it comes down to some details of how how what, as soon as you create a nuclei, you just suck a whole bunch of the precursor away from that, that, that area, and so you prevent nuclei from forming around it. Um, we can also do cool things, such as changing the substrate, so we change the density. We can control, no, we can control where nuclei form, and then based on this, that was, uh, kind, of, uh, that was kind of the original work that we did. Then the next question was, can we make this useful for electronic devices? Because that's the whole, that's the whole point. So now what we actually do is instead of showing, instead of growing these, you know, random large scale films, what we can actually do is go on top of our silicon, silicon dioxide substrate, right, which is exactly what we just talked about, because that's what we need. We can pattern templates of this liquid indium, we can pattern templates of it, um, and then we can expose it to phosphorus, and you can actually see that we get this nice indium phosphide crystal growing, 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 and then just consumes an entire template. So what it allows us to do is it allows us to say, all right, now on the back end, you know, in the back end, I can actually, you know, put some, I can pattern something, you know, using normal photolithography, I can pattern something, and I can control, I can controllably put the crystal exactly where I want. So that's what then will allow us to make devices. Um, then we can also, you know, I show, this is just a bunch of different materials. So it's, it's, this is a general approach. And that's kind of what's important here is that 
while we're aiming towards certain devices, we're also on the way creating kind of this platform that allows people to be able to integrate whatever types of devices they want. Because as I said in the, in the, in the beginning, right, I think, I think that what's going to happen is that we're going to need to be able to heterogeneously integrate many different types of functional units with high bandwidth between them. So different functional, different materials enable different functional units, right? If you want a gas sensor, if you want an LED, if you want a you know a photo detector, if you want um, uh, you know if you want high speed uh, high speed uh, you know ultra high speed FET, those all require different material systems. Now. Um, this is really too far for this seminar, but it's so cool that I like to flash it anyway. Um, and let me explain to you why when I saw this, I was super giddy. Because normally, right, I said that it's really hard to grow a nice crystal on an amorphous substrate. It's even harder to grow a nice crystal on a different crystal substrate. Because what happens is that, you know, um, if I if there's you know no order in my substrate, then there's this natural order that comes from you know the, the, the organization of the atoms. But if there's another substrate which has a totally different crystal structure which my material doesn't want to take, that will force the material that I'm growing to take that undesired crystal structure and it'll cause all kinds of nonsense, all kinds of problems. So here, what we're actually showing is a lateral heterostructure between indium phosphide and tin phosphide. Don't worry about the uses cases for tin phosphide. It's interesting for batteries and things like that. But the key thing here to point out is that this is the crystal structure for indium phosphide, and this is the crystal structure for tin phosphide. And if you look at this high-res transmission electron microscope, you can see that we actually have this beautiful interface, almost atomically sharp, between two materials, a single crystal on, on, a, on a reasonable scale, and have completely different crystal structures. So this is cool because what it does is it opens us up to thinking about new types of electronic interfaces that we couldn't necessarily manufacture before. Okay, and so that's kind of that's kind of it in terms of this. So then the next thing we obviously wanted to do, um, next thing we obviously wanted to do is start making certain types of devices. So <coughs> excuse me. So uh, um, first thing. Uh, well, it's not the first thing, but you know, after a lot of effort and, and work, we made some pretty nice uh, uh, transistors out of these things. And so, uh, what we do to make a transistor is, unlike you know, unlike the, the previous things where we just growing circles and things like that, we'd actually just grow these crystalline materials into strips. You know, because that's for transistors. It's a kind of you know, lengthwise. Um, you have electrons that move. And so then what we can do is we actually we make those into transistors. We you know we do some processing, make it you know make it look nice. Um, and then it turns out that we can actually get really nicely well behaved FETs out of these. And so th the key thing about this is this is actually grown on the back end directly. And it's directly grown on a silicon silicon dioxide substrate. And um, the performance of these, so these are still long channel devices, but the performance of these is actually very good. So we're showing that we can make these back-end devices with intrinsic um, uh, transport properties of the electrons that are excellent, that are on the you know on par with silicon or better, better than silicon. And remember that in terms of back-end devices, we're not even we're not actually competing with silicon. Um, we're competing with things that are you know amorphous, things that have very performance that are tens of tens or hundreds of times worse than silicon. However, now we're trying to, we're, we're making this argument that we can actually, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, uh, potentially integrate on top of uh, um, on top of the silicon uh, devices, which are almost as good or even better in some cases. Yeah. Layers that we grow, just the substrate, or it's on top of the substrate. Of the substrate. That's right. So that's the. That's the uh, that's the key thing here is that we're not trying to not trying to eliminate silicon, right? We're trying to say we can make this first layer of devices, and then on top of it, we can grow these crystals, and then we can turn them into useful devices. Because as soon as you grow a good material, you can then turn it into a useful device. Um, and so and there's a lot of there's a lot of details here. I won't really bore you with them, uh, but effectively we make. So I showed one device. We can also make arrays of devices because you know you obviously need more than one if you want to make circuits. 
Um, and uh, um, there's also other types of sensors we can make. So this is a different material that we're growing called indium arsenide, where we make magnetic sensors out of them, arrays of magnetic sensors. Um, and the performance is about, so currently when it comes to actually magnetic sensors, um, it turns out, turns out that, uh, um, it turns out they're super useful. And a lot of people make them in silicon. You just have, you fabricate silicon and you use this, you know, Hall effect to, to make arrays of silicon sensors. People also fabricate them in these three fives because they're really high performance. But you can't make arrays of them in three fives because it's too expensive and, and whatnot. So what we've actually shown is that we can take our materials, we can grow it directly on top of silicon, we've made high performance arrays of them. Um, so it kind of shows them. This is showing some optoelectronic devices where we actually make optical cavities and we can actually control the output. You know, we have this optical cavity spectrum coming out. So it's really showing that we're creating this toolbox for new types of devices, right? So um, and there's more material stuff, but what I want to get to, because we're already at 1140, um, is that the next thing we wanted to look at was, uh, and usually I put this up because I'm talking to people who have no idea what's, what's going on here. I'm, I'm going to ignore this slide because you people, <laughs> you all know better than me uh, what's going on here. The first thing uh, uh, we wanted to try is we wanted to say, all right, well, can we actually make uh, uh, devices? So, actually, before I go into this, I should say, one of the key things that we're actually working on right now is taking those, for example, those transistors that we made and turning them into memory that we can integrate directly on top of, uh, directly on top of a compute link. So, because then you have very high bandwidth connection between memory and compute, which is useful for traditional, uh, traditional, uh, 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 traditional AI type algorithms without, I mean, you don't really need that much. Energy. You just need to make one, you know, one good memory device that we can scale. Um, and then once you do that, right, we don't need that much innovation in terms of the architectures or the or uh, or the actual, you know, the actual devices. <coughs> On the other hand, one of the things that we were interested in is that you know people have been talking about spiking neural networks, um, and people have been talking about you know can we actually make functional units that can say mimic uh, biological synapses. And so, um, you know, I was sitting down with one of my students and he said, you know, we make a lot of bad transistors. Uh, bad transistors are transistors that show hysteresis in their behavior because charges get trapped in, you know, when they're moving around, charges get trapped, and then a few seconds later they get detrapped. And he said, but you know, that's kind of like, that's kind of how synapses work. Um, you know, you have basically these various types of uh, processes which have time scales that are not uh, 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 that are, you know, that are on the second second scale or even lo longer. So can we actually make a single unit that can mimic some of the functionalities that occur in our brain? Because right now, when people try to do this, they actually make, you use it, uh, they make silicon uh, devices and they make silicon devices with about, you know, 10 transistors or so. And so it turns out that the area of these these kind of bio-mimicking -mimic synapses are, are, are quite large. And so because they're quite large, you, you don't have a pathway to scale towards the, the side, the, the level that you need. So because you don't have this pathway to scale towards the level that you need, um, uh, you, you know, the, 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 there's issues there. So, so what we said is, all right, can we actually go back and can we look at processes that occur in our devices which we don't like, which we normally try to eliminate, and can we actually start to engineer them to create the functionality that we need? Which means, can we create them such such that you know uh, gate voltage pulses to our transistors can actually be converted into decaying, basically decaying memory signal? Can we actually do that? And then, can we actually have some control over that such that there's potentially short-term decays, long-term decays, just like what happens in our synapses? And so, um, what I'm showing here is just you know various. Uh, 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 various plots, but this is what I want to point out is this is the current versus the signal, the voltage on the gate. Okay, and what's happening here is we're sweeping from zero to minus five and back to plus five. And you can see that well, it's, it's zero to plus five and then zero to minus five and then back. And what you can see is that when I, I go up and I come back, they don't, they're not at the same point, right? Same thing here, they're not at the same point. And this is normally bad. Right? So normally we actually tune all our parameters to get rid of this. 
And you know, it's, it's well established. We have transistors that work in our devices, so we can't get rid of this. Uh, so, but um, the question was, can we actually instead go the opposite direction and engineer this functionality into our devices? Can we engineer it in, and then show that this allows us to do things like short-term potentiation, long-term potentiation, short-term depression, long-term depression. And so that's actually what we're showing in, in this graph is uh, it's basically showing the normalized current out of the transistor. We're showing a spike, and then we're showing how there's this initial decay. And then there's a, you know, a long-term potentiation, meaning a change in the state of that device. Um, and then here we're showing how that, that the actual, uh, the weight change the way change is affected by you know the function of the, the spikes and whatnot. Um, so basically, what it showed us is that okay, there's actually some possibility for doing this. So then the next question um, we had is, are there uh, you know when you have a, a synapse, then it actually responds to different. So if I have a bunch of pulses that come in, it will respond differently than if I have a single pulse come in. So can we actually then engineer that functionality? And so what we're showing here is this curve of basically normalized current uh, versus time for different numbers of pulses. So you can see that there's just one pulse, we get a certain decay. There's 20, we get another type of decay, another type of potentiation. If there's 100 that come immediately after each other, we get another type of decay, another type of potentiation. So this is pretty interesting because what we're actually doing here is we're, we're taking, uh, what fundamentally they're charge traps. We're taking charge traps in our gate oxide and we're saying, all right, well, we're actually using that time constant. We're using those charge traps to engineer functionality into the devices, which are not typical, which are potentially bio, uh, which can you know, mimic certain types of biological synapses. And so then we show both short-term weight changes, long-term weight changes. Uh, but one of the questions that we had is, is it possible to you know, engineer some kind of learning rule into that? Because that's the, that, that's, that's the I mean, Learning rules, even despite the fact that in, uh, despite the fact that there's a lot of, uh, I would say maybe not controversy, but there's questions about whether you know whether these learning rules that people have for you know biological neural networks are real uh, or whatnot. I'm saying that's okay. You guys can tell me what rules you want, and I can make them. Right. That's that's the that's the the fundamental process here. And so, what happens in normal uh, uh, you know synapses is that a pulse comes in. It gets transduced by the synapse. It goes out, and it gets reflected at the on the next on the next neuron or the next synapse, and it comes back. And then, because of that reflection, there's actually potentially learned. There's changes in the synapse that happen due to these relative uh, uh, um, relative firing processes. So our question was, can we can we basically mimic these pulses that occur on the input and the output? And as a function of the difference in the time. Can we actually get a change in behavior of the synapse? And so normally what happens is that they, this delta t is, is referring to the difference in time between the, 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 the pulse that happens afterwards and the pulse that happens after, after the shift. Let me rephrase it. It's the difference in time between the pulse that occurs downstream from the synapse and the pulse that occurs upstream from the synapse, right? And so what we can actually show is that <coughs> By modulating these pulses that are on the input and the output side, we can actually could get get learning or or changes in the weight of the synapse, which is effectively you know this this long term change is effectively like learning or like modulation of the synapse. We can get these changes that are actually directly related to the relative timings of these pulses that mimic the kind of spike timing, uh, 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 STDP spike timing dependent plasticity that. That, that they've shown that they showed in you know those those the classic papers on these. So that was cool, um, but effectively what we were everything that we've shown here are just kind of the fundamental units of 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 of, of behavior in these synapses. So the next question I had is, can we make more complex structures such that we can do things like have you know short term to kind of long term. Uh, transfer. So if we have some input that's continuously occurring over the course of, I don't know, tens of seconds, we can go from like a short-term memory to a long-term memory, meaning a change in the synaptic weight, uh, you know, from short-term storage to long-term storage. Probably don't have to talk to you guys about this too much, uh, but effectively this was the question. Can we make a single functional unit that does that? 
right? Can we engineer it? And so <clears throat> what we did here, there's a lot of details here, but what we effectively did here is we, we took our normal transistors, which just had a single oxide on top of the gate, so a single oxide that we had just tuned to get may have traps in it, and we actually made it heterogeneous. So by making it heterogeneous, what it allows us to do is it allows us to have charge traps that have significantly different time constants that are in series with each other. So effectively, it's almost like making a ladder. So I can take charge from my indium phosphide, I can put it in this first charge trap that you know, decays in the course of a few seconds. Um, and then if another pulse comes in and moves into this next charge trap, also decays in tens of seconds. Next one also decays. But if there's another one, it actually goes into this long-term trap and it hangs out there for you know whatever whatever time we've engineered it for. <coughs> so that's effectively um, what we tried to do here by 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 tuning the the barriers that electrons feel. So for example, this is the indium phosphide over here, and electrons kind of get stuck in charge traps in this oxide, and then uh, um, as they move through here, they go into this uh, this other oxide which have very different time constant charge traps. And so by, by doing that, the question is, uh, well, and this is just showing that the behavior works the way we expect it to, but by doing that, can we actually have it such that when we have these multiple spikes coming in, can we eventually get this kind of quote unquote remembering behavior? And so the interesting thing is that, so this is for example, so showing spikes that come in every 10 seconds, um, and it shows that there's this the kind of consistent delta, um, uh, long-term delta W, change in the weight, change in the current, showing that after a set of spikes, it actually remembers it. Um, and it also, uh, it also uh, shows, so for example, here we're showing behavior uh, with a certain type of spike, uh, uh, spike voltage and spike duration, where you, you get some remembering, but eventually it just decays away. Um, but on the other hand, if you take that same thing and you shorten the spike interval, because remember, as we move through these charge traps, they're decaying away. You shorten the spike interval, you get you actually get a change in this weight. Now, a lot of work we have to do here um, to, to understand this more. But basically, as I mentioned before, the fundamental principle here is that you know we start off, we have our channel which has electrons moving this way, and as we get electrons stuck in here, you modulate the charge in the channel. And so, for every spike, you first get these charges stuck in these short-term traps. And then eventually they kind of move through this ladder and they'll get stuck in the long-term crap. Now this um, is interesting, but I think that uh, um, uh, what I wanted to highlight from this is something I was talking to you about earlier, is that there are a lot of fundamental processes that are available to us. And I know a lot of them because I spent most of my career battling them. Get rid of them. However, we're now in this stage where there are these, you know, this, this potential to actually encode certain parts of algorithms directly into these processes. And maybe, just maybe, we can start to think about how we can go beyond you know, just integrating things with normal digital CMOS or even just normal memory by taking advantage of these various types of processes. Right. Um, and I think I put the slide in here because I was going to come back to it and reiterate it, but I think I got it. I think I, think I got it. Um, so last thing, which is we only have one slide on it, um, but it's 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 a kind of the long-term direction we're moving in here. And what we do is we 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 microfabricate devices and arrays of electrodes, and then we give it to one of our our friends or collaborators, and they actually grow uh, cells on top of it. They literally will grow cells. Um, uh, in this case, they're hard cells. Um, and then what we can actually show is that we can have, you know, more advanced control over how those hard cells will be than if you have the normal approach, which is you grow cells on a film and you stick two big electrodes in there. Because we can actually start to, um, we can actually start to uh, give signals to these 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 cells on a on, on a diff, kind of a different scale than you could do with a traditional kind of a lab on a chip type approach. And so the, the long-term long goal with this is that we can actually start to integrate not only, uh, not only say, for example, pacing electrodes, but multiple different types of inputs and multiple different types of sensors at a very, very high density. And by doing that, we can actually 
both be able to observe cells at a, on a new scale and also control them on a new scale. Meaning we could have new new ways of you know poking around at them through both electrical and optical, maybe even thermal uh, and mechanical input. And so effectively, that's what we're showing here is that we actually have the ability to kind of locally control how these cells, these heart cells, pace. Um, which is actually, so one thing I should say about heart cells is once you grow them, they just automatically start pacing. That's just, that's why, you know, that's, that's why our hearts work so, so well. They just, you, you grow them and they just start, they just start feeding. Um, uh, but, you know, you can also control that. And that's what we're showing here is that this ability to do this external control using these microfabricated, uh, microfabricated electro, <coughs> electro, electrodes and circuits. And so that's kind of it. Um, we're, we're funded from a variety of sources. Um, for this work, our, our funding comes primarily from NSF, Semiconductor Research Corporation. Um, and although it's kind of a general grant where everybody has access to it, we, are, we, we work a lot with Intel. Um, they're the ones who seem to be the most interested in this. Um, uh, and then also uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, because it turns out that being able to do this type of mixed growth has the potential to dramatically reduce the cost of uh, IR, shortwave IR detectors, and it turns out that three fives are so expensive, and the way you make these shortwave IR detectors are so expensive that it even limits the science you can do when you turn things up in the space. Um, so, so that's that's where JPL's interest is. And uh, um, Air Force, we we have some contracts with Air Force, but that's actually for kind of some different projects where um, where we're really making new types of devices that use electrons in different ways. But no way I would have been able to talk about that here, not enough time. Um, and you know, I, I have a bunch of students that are fantastic postdoctoral researchers. And uh, with that, you know, thanks for taking the time uh, out of your day to listen to this very like far afield talk. And I hope I've been able to kind of deliver some perspective on some of the challenges that we have. But I also, I also want to say that there are real opportunities that exist here to look at algorithms and to look at fundamental processes, start to connect them together. Um, why? Because people like me don't need to work on scaling anymore. So let's start to think about some other things that we can do. All right, with that, thank you. Well, we have time for at least a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about the power consumption differences? Sure, 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 sure. Um, so right now in terms of, um, so with this type of synapse, the way the, the power consumption works is it scales directly with the, not with the, not with the capacitance of the device itself, but the capacitance of the lines that connect to this device. So for example, one of the things that we're looking at is how do we build, how do we build basically analog, base, traditional memory, flash memory, analog accelerators for neural networks. So not for not for what I showed here, but just fundamentally to accelerate these uh, um, vector matrix multiplies. And when we look at the power consumption for those, it's entirely dominated by the, the line capacitance, the, the, uh, the metal line capacitance in the actual uh, in the actual arrays. So it turns out that what you need, you can't really control that too much. I mean, it just, it is, it's a physical structure. So what it turns out is you need to be able to push the voltage down as much as possible because that voltage is what controls how much charge you put on those metal lines, which controls how much energy you use per, uh, per device. And so uh, um, uh, what we've seen is that, I'm trying to, trying to think the numbers. Uh, what we've seen is that for an array of 500 nanometer by 500 nanometer devices, we have a consumption. Uh, we have a consumption of something like 10 to the minus. I think it's a, a, a mil, an array of a million 500 by 500 nanometer devices. We have an array of. I mean, we have a power consumption of. Uh, I think 10 to the minus six, so uh, 10 to the minus six joules. So one, uh, one microjoule uh, for an entire read or write cycle. Um, and so then you have a million devices, so it's one microjoule per device, and you divide it by a million, and so 
that gives you one picojoule of power consumption per cycle. Um, so that, that's, um, I, I just need a little bit of so, um, so for, for flash or, uh, or, or SRAM, it turns out that because you're continuously keeping it active, the power consumption is much, much larger. Um, this, so effectively, it's, it's lower than digital, but it's higher than some of the emerging memories, such as memristors. That's kind of where it sits. So it's, it's, it's lower than digital, but higher than, uh, um, uh, uh, than uh, um, a lot of these emerging devices. Because we're not, we're not, you know, we're not using resistive RAM or anything like that. We're actually using more traditional flash type memories, but integrating them and using them in a different, different, different way. Question that may not be central. Yes. There has been previous work at USC, I know, about living cells touching uh, electronic uh, devices. Is that what? No, this is a happen? little. This is uh, different. We actually, this <laughs> this whole thing kind of came about two years ago. Uh, I was having a sandwich at a sandwich shop, and Megan walked in, and we started talking, and uh, you know, we, we knew each other pretty well from before, but suddenly we said, hey, you know, there's this opportunity to do this. Um, and she said, you know, we have these initial these problems, and especially when it comes to how do we do, you know, high density measurements and how do we do things like that. And I said, you know, well, we're making, uh, we're basically making things in non-traditional substrates. So we can make it on glass, and we can make it on transparent substrates. It's important to them because they need to be able to actually. They look. They like to look at things, right? That's um, that's what that's that's a, it's an important tool for biologists, and so that's kind of that was kind of the genesis. Um, so it's not that's not the just, more people who look, you know, it, it, you know, there are uh, devices that keep hearts beating yeah. today, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is people did yes, 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 yes. oh. actually having processors touch living cells, but they tend to die. Yeah, exactly. And, that's right. So basically, what we're really doing here is, uh, um, you know, we don't we don't we don't see us making silicon processors. We do that just because everything seems to die on both sides. So what we're actually working on is coming from the back end where we're saying we have these new types of processes to be able to make high performance semiconductors. Let's start with what keeps everything alive and then let's see what we can build into that. So that's our perspective is coming from that uh, longevity uh, direction. Uh, but yes, and, and, and you know, there's a, uh, there's a ton of people who work on uh, like these kind of implantable uh, things, but those are, those are working on somewhat of a different scale. From what we're looking at. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker once again. Thanks. All right. So, what do I do here? There we go.